then let's begin then I think I think I'll start in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit amen Lord give me the heart of a child and the awesome courage to live it out as an adult amen Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit amen all righty well good morning everybody thank you so much for joining me uh I will try to click along here at a nice pace uh, and I'm sorry if I've overloaded the slides with information. I just didn't want to forget anything. Still had to cut stuff, of course. But maybe we'll have time to discuss that in the question and answer, answer session. Welcome to our very last Chester session of the year. I hope I ended on a nice note. So uh, obviously, many of you are deciding what you're going to do after you graduate. Uh, but one thing you should be thinking about now, I think, in advance is what are you going to do before you graduate a second time? Presumably, when you go into your degree, you're going to want to graduate from that, and very likely, it's going to involve some kind of capstone project. So the capstone project that our grade 12s just did is, is likely not your last capstone project. So I would encourage you to start thinking now, not just about what you want to study in your degree, like what you want to major in and do after that, but specifically beyond that, when you are wrapping up that degree, what do you want to devote your attention and your time and your mental energy to studying as part of your final capstone project? Uh, and now I would say my my rule would be try to think of something that will not just give you a good grade or maybe you know qualify you, uh, something you can use later on to show an employer to hire you, but also something that you will enhance yourself, something that you think will personally be beneficial to you. Uh, I'll give you an example. So when I did my master's of theological studies, I picked the theology of Hans Urs von Balthasar as the topic of my capstone paper. Some of you may have heard of him. He was a Swiss priest who wrote voluminously on lots of topics, beauty, truth, goodness, prayer, meditation, Christian life, lots of stuff. But he also left the Jesuits to found a community, the community of St. John, which was a community of lay people. Uh, and he actually lived for a while because he had to leave the Jesuits. Um, and it was like sort of homeless for a bit. So he had to live with a family. It was a Swiss doctor and his wife who had converted from Protestantism to Catholicism. And he actually observed how they raised their children. So he had, uh, for how academic and, and, um, high-minded a lot of his writing is he did have a lot of practical experience in the world as well and seeing the, the sort of normal christian lay life now at his funeral uh ratzinger the future pope benedict XVI, described him he was quoting another theologian but he said balthasar was the most cultured man of the 20th century he was very aristocratic very well read uh he could play uh classical music from like beethoven and mozart on the piano from memory uh, I'm not going to show you Balthazar's favorite photograph of himself. Right. There are photographs of him with popes, all right, with other great theologians of the 20th century, but this was his favorite photograph of himself. Was it when he was visiting? <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure some of you can identify if this is Disneyland or Disney World. I offhand don't remember, but here is the most cultured man of the 20th century shaking hands with Mickey Mouse. All right. So this very cultured, sophisticated man, one of the most incredible minds I've ever studied, was also known for his childlikeness. All right. Now, I picked Balthasar as my topic because I could see something practical in his thought, even though it is there's a lot of kind of German romanticism and mysticism, and it's very academic in some cases, but I could tell that there was still something really practical about it. Uh, and to give a sense of what I mean, here's an anecdote about him. When he died, and he had been commanded by the Pope to become a cardinal, he kept being asked to be a cardinal, he kept declining. Finally, John Paul II said, no, you have to become a cardinal. But before he could go to Rome to be, <laughs> to, be in, uh, to receive the red hat, he actually died. And in his desk was found the completed manuscript of a book. And apparently his plan was to gift this book to his friends at Christmas time. Uh, he died in like June, so didn't get a chance to, obviously. And here is the title of that book. Unless you become like this child. I think as far as I know, this was the last book he wrote. Certainly it was one of his last. And it obviously comes from this very famous passage in the Gospels, right? At this time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them and said, assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives the one little child like this in my name receives me. Worth meditating on. Now, at the time I was doing my master's, my wife was teaching kindergarten. 
And I was working part-time at a daycare, which was owned, still is owned by her parents, actually. And I was discerning that probably I was going to follow her into education. So it seemed relevant to me to study this, this great thinker who had seen such theological value to studying and observing children. Uh, and I actually applied for certification to be a daycare worker. And they, they were, it's just like being a, a teacher here. They review all your educational background to see if you're qualified. And I got a report back from the government saying, we don't see anything in your education that seems relevant to child care work. And uh, I think it's because they had they didn't know about Balazar. They didn't realize that actually Christology is extremely relevant for daycare work, I would suggest, if, if Balthazar is right. Yeah. And of course, this has recently become very relevant in my life, even beyond my professional life, all right? Uh, the importance to the theology of babies, let's say. So I've been revisiting my capstone paper recently, and I wanted to share some of what I found in there with you. So I, I have a duty, right? I don't just have to teach uh, many of you, but uh, I have to teach. I have to teach Benedict. But what's he teaching me? Well, according to Balthazar, he teaches me about Jesus, and it's interesting, right? The Gospels don't tell us a great, great deal about Jesus' internal psychology. We sometimes are told about his emotions, but um, it's not like you know modern literature where we'd get all this great exploration of his psyche. That's as, as Balthazar says. There are there's dark veils drawn over Jesus' interior life, but babies might teach us something about him, and. Uh, and his innocence and his soul, his human soul. So let's, let's first of all, let's look at this passage again. All right. Jesus called a little child to him. And Balthazar points this out. Jesus did not seek out a model child. Right? He didn't pick out the cute one, the best behaved one. All right. The ones who pose for those uh, photographs that they use to sell you toys and, and children's clothing, right? They always pick the most idyllic children, right? He just picked a kid, right? Yeah, the Gerber baby, precisely, right? Just your average child, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna plant this right now. So start thinking about this. I'll I'll ask you to share in a few minutes in the chat or however you'd like to. What are some things that characterize children in general? And, and I don't mean that just the cute ones or the well-behaved ones or the model babies, but your average kid you'd find in a daycare or you know at the you know in the stallery or whatever, right? Freshly born babies. What what do they all have in common? Characterizes almost all of them. There's another level here. There's another degree to this. When Jesus says that you must become like this child to be saved, Balthazar suggests that he doesn't just mean the child that he's holding up right now, right? This child, he says, is also Jesus himself. Right? As Balthazar says, Jesus speaks with such familiarity about the child's specific manner of being and dignity that such knowledge must be rooted in his own experience, all right? Um, there's something about childlikeness in general. Again, not just the nice kids, but any child you could find. Something about that child reflects something about Jesus and his own experience. Right? Um, oh, yeah. So you'll notice uh, that people love to depict Jesus as a baby. Right? Uh, the infant Jesus of Prague, right? Uh, Santo Bambino, Bambino Jesu. Uh, my wife is from Cebu, Philippines. They love their Santo Nino there. There's a whole story about the conversion of the Philippines that goes back to the statue. People just love to show, right, uh, ba Jesus as a baby. Uh, there's a film, it's a comedy film called uh, Talladega Nights. There's a scene where the main character is praying uh, before the before meal, saying grace, and he says, He's talking to the baby Jesus. He prays to the tiny baby Jesus in his golden fleece diapers with his tiny balled up fists. And his wife interjects and says, honey, you know, Jesus did grow up. You, you don't always have to call him baby. I like the Christmas Jesus best when I'm saying grace. Right? For some reason, people in their devotional life, they seem very drawn specifically to the baby Jesus. Right? Now, there's something to this, actually, Balthazar will suggest. All right. Maybe Ricky Bobby is more of a theologian than his wife realized. Uh, even though Jesus did grow up into a man, there is something fitting about seeing him as a child. But for now, let's just remember that the childlikeness of Jesus is meant to be an example for us. We're supposed to be childlike because he's childlike. Right? He's youthful by nature and imparts this faithfulness to the church, this youthfulness to the church, I should say. Uh, and again, 1 Corinthians 2.16, we have the mind of Christ. Oh, what does that mean? Something about childlikeness. It's understanding what it means to be like a child. Well, uh, help us to imitate this child, right? So what are some things that are characterize all children, especially babies? I'm going to look at some comments here. Um, angelic looks. Well, that's that's true, right? Uh, there's something heavenly about babies. Uh, they fully trust. Yes, there's an implicit trust and faith to them. They are simple-minded. Yes, you have to be straightforward for them, right? 
a keen sense of justice, right? Like Chesterton says, adults, because we're more guilty, we prefer mercy, but children are comparatively innocent, so they prefer justice. Right? Innocence, yes, which doesn't mean that they're always like charming and sweet, but there is an innocence to them, isn't there, right? Care only about the present. True, yes, right? There, there's something that they want that's imminent, right? They don't necessarily like uh, plan long-term, right? And you think of what Jesus says, right? Don't don't take thought for the morrow. Don't take thought for tomorrow. God will take care of that, right? He's like, he provides for the sparrows. So he'll provide for you. Demanding. They know how to get what they want. Yes, they are willing. And remember, what does Jesus say to us, right? Be willing to demand from your father. Ask your father for the Holy Spirit. You know, when your child asks you for, you know, <laughs> for bread, do you give them a scorpion? <laughs> that's not how, that's not how uh, parents operate if they're loving. Patience is limited or non-existent. Yes, there's a kind of insistence to them. I didn't talk about this much in the slideshow, but I'll say this right now. Um, Balthazar did write a book on St. Therese of Lejeune, so her own impetuousness and childlikeness does also give us some indication of, you know, I insist on grace from Jesus and I will not relent until he gives it to me. Yes. They say whatever comes into their mind. Yeah, there's an honesty to them, isn't there? Curiosity, yes. Uh, as Chesterton says, in a baby's mind, the world is created for the first time. Every, every time you see a baby in their eyes, the world is as fresh as it was on the first day of creation, or the sixth day of creation. Right, inside those mushroom-shaped heads, as Chesterton puts it, the world is being recreated. Um, they like looking at and touching everything. Exactly. There's a the joy in creation. And in, in every object in creation, there's a joy, right? And vulnerability. Yes, they're not prideful or strong, right? They're very dependent on us, right? So here's some things I came up with from observing my own son, right? Uh, so first of all, babies are poor. They don't own anything of their own, right? They can't. How, what, what would that even mean, right? Um, and they can't control themselves. Um, yeah, well, childlikeness, right? Ch ch teens are, <laughs> yes, there's something childlike about teens. Ch actually, Balthazar makes the point that in an ancient world, you weren't really considered a man until you were almost like 50, right? So Jesus actually does kind of remain a child even in his, into his 30s. So uh, there's something to be said for that. Right? And again, yeah, and Jesus, like teenagers, uh, on his own has nowhere to lay his head. You know, right? He's just, the foxes have holes, but Jesus and teenagers are dependent on their, on their father and mother, let's say. Uh, they don't control themselves, right? You got to carry them around everywhere. Right? I mean, they have self, a certain degree of self-control, but they don't have autonomy over where they go or what they're doing. Right? They're totally dependent. Right? As exciting as it is to see them grow independence, which they receive from you. Right? They love the people that they know. Now, my son is getting to the point where he'll cry if he doesn't know you and you hold him. But he, if, if, he tr if he knows you a little bit, he trusts you. Right? And he loves you. He loves looking at you. Right? Uh, again, as was mentioned, when they're in need, they're willing to cry out helplessly. They're not too proud right? To cry out for help. Um, they need community, all right? They need, they need people around them in some way. They need their top quiet time, too, but they need like a network. This is why it's great if you happen to live in the same city as uh, your parents, right? Now, whatever your relationship is to your parents, having the grandparents around, I mean, I just think of what Joachim and Anna, right? We're probably a godsend to uh, the Holy Family. They are both to demand what they need. They do not, they, again, which sounds you know, it can sound demanding, but there's also no pride in that, right? Sometimes pride uh, prevents us from showing how vulnerable we are by asking for something, right? There may be something annoying about being demanding, but there's certainly nothing prideful about it. And they love to play, right? Babies love to play. So we'll, we'll look at this more in a second, but here, here's some of the heady theology stuff, right? Balazar sees Jesus' human childhood as representing what happens in the Trinity itself, right? So we know from the Creed, right? The word is eternally begotten of the Father, Right, that process of being begotten from from the womb of the Father, as one confession puts it, is eternal. It's timeless, which means that Jesus, the Word, the Son, is eternally a newborn child. Right? So God's eternal Word was once a child, and hence He has always remained a child. Balthazar says He became a child of men because He was never, nor ever will be, anything other than the eternal child of the Father. Because He was once the child of men, He can constantly reveal His eternal childlikeness in a form that is human and intelligible to humans. So from eternity, he sees the father as Abba, right? Which was an Aramaic term that, you know, it means daddy. Uh, and uh, the son resembles the father. He's a perfect likeness of the father we see from scripture. Just like uh, sometimes babies resemble their own parents when they were babies too. Uh, the son resembles the father. Uh, yes, this is this is me as an infant. This is me as a newborn. <laughs> um, so what does it mean to say the word became a baby? Well, because what's interesting is if you look at all these words for babies, and, and you all know that from my Latin classes, I love etymology. 
whether that's Bambino or baby or infant or, you know, whatever your preferred name is for newborns and children and, and little babies, there are always words that have to do with the fact that they can't really speak yet. Like baby, Bambino, those are the same root as babble. It, it's a sound that babies make. It, it's that pre-linguistic sound that they utter. And infant, it's, it's from in, in in Latin and fare. Fare is one of the words for to speak. So it literally means not being able to speak is what an infant is. Um, that's why Psalm 8 talks about, right? Like from the mouths of babes and infants, you have ordained praise. Like there's something miraculous about it. So the word, the eternal word of God is now the wordless baby, the babbling baby. But what does that mean? It means that the word speaks even without words. He's teaching us simply by being a baby, which means there's something about babyhood or babiness or childlikeness that teaches, that is the word of God itself. Again, this is, you know, this is the headier stuff, you know, you can delve into, but now, of course, Jesus does grow up, but Balthazar says that the youthfulness of the word of God keeps him young. Remember, he is eternally the child. Right. He's, he, he has the second person of the Trinity being eternally begotten. He's always a child. So even when he's growing up in a human way, he's still always childlike. He says, it is the flame that blazes in the Gospels and prevents the word of Christ from ever being completely at home in the disenchanted world of grownups. All right. Which is why the Sermon on the Mount appears so odd among all the other ethical systems of mankind because of its utopian, uncompromising idealism. Have you ever noticed how childlike the Sermon on the Mount is? It's not practical. It's not very adult. All right. Adults are, have, are realistic. We know this stuff doesn't work. We know you can't just constantly be a peacemaker and forgive people who slap you or like someone steals from you and then you give them more stuff. Like that's not, you can't sustain a system this way. That's not, you know, very rational. That's the way it a child would think right this is like when i you know when i used to teach grade three and kids would say like why are people poor let's just get rid of money and then so of course my brain is like trying to explain to them well no like there has to be some kind of medium of exchange because you know you got to produce things in order for there to be goods but no just there shouldn't be money anymore well there's something about that in the sermon on the mount right there's this kind of bluntness to it that that's that and this ethical as was mentioned children love justice uh that is un unfitting in the world of adults, but Christ keeps that. He maintains that childlikeness throughout his life. Now, Balthazar says that babies are masters of play and also masters of contemplation. So he has this discourse on play that is just, I, you don't expect to find this stuff in, in these kind of dusty, arid theological tomes. He says, play is where the child really creates its world. So the only rules for play belong to that fairy tale world where children, when they are alone among themselves, or when they are among themselves or alone, uh, that world has its own laws, which change with the caprices and unfathomable decisions of the child. Now, those of you, which many of you, <laughs> that's as many of you, have been around babies or at least small children and watched them play or had to play with them, you'll, you'll know exactly what he's talking about here. You can tell he lived with a family when he writes this. Um, now one is a tree, now a bird, or a red balloon, and then suddenly a horse, a dwarf, or a giant. Play knows only one law, itself. There's, there's no logic to this. The kid has now decided that, you know, this is not an elephant anymore. Now it's a lollipop. Now, now we're going to comply with this. Now it's a tree, <laughs> right? It, it, it all depends on the desire of the child, basically. The creative whimsy of the child. I notice that God also creates playfully. Jesus creates playfully. Proverbs 8 shows the pre-incarnate Christ, the wisdom, the eternal Sophia, right, uh, of God, the logos of God, right? It is portrayed as, um, go, go read the wisdom literature. It's so beautiful. But Proverbs 8 talks about, I delighted in God as he created the world, and I danced and played with him over the crawl of creation, right? Sure is. Yep. You recognize uh, the gift there, Veronica? Well done. Yes. I made sure to represent that, you know. Uh, and Chesterton talks about this too. Chesterton also has a rich uh, theology of the child, you could say. But uh, And you all probably know this quote, but it's so worth going over. He says, because children have abounding vitality, because they are in spirit fierce and free. Therefore, they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he is nearly dead. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exalt in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exalt in monotony. It's possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun, and every morning, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never gotten tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy, for we have sinned and grown old, 
and our father is younger than we are. So there's a childlikeness to God's creation, right? As you go, as you pointed out, the children like to touch everything. They're delighted by everything. They, they want to see it. They want to put it in their mouth, right? And, and kind of be united to it. Well, why would God create all this stuff? I mean, we know he creates because he loves, because he has this rich love for every object he creates, every sparrow right, that falls in the bush he knows about, every hair on your head he individually created. I mean, that takes the abounding vitality and delight in things that a child has. And Balthazar suggests that the saints have playfulness too. He gives a bunch of examples. Like I said, I, I trimmed considerably in the interest of time. But he says, for example, Francis of Assisi, there's a childlikeness to the way he delights in the natural world, right? To his canticle of creatures. Notice he, he gives names the way that children do, like uh, brother sun and sister moon, right? Like it's, well, you know, this is this is Mr. Carr. This is Mrs. Keys. Right? They like to play with things that kind of ascribe, uh, let's say, personality to them, right? But Francis does this in a very theologically profound way. But there's even another one, and, and this will, I remember being delighted when I read this. Some of you will remember from philosophy class the ontological argument that Anselm of Canterbury has. Descartes has this too, right? Sort of, um, sort of Goodell, that God is a being greater than which cannot be conceived. I can conceive of God. It's better to exist in reality to only exist in the imagination. Therefore, God must exist. Right? Because he's a being greater than which cannot be conceived. And if he didn't exist, you could conceive something better than him. Now, whatever you think of that argument, Balzar points this out. He's like, that's the, arg that's the definition of God that a little kid would come up with. Like, have, have you ever heard little kids kind of brag about like their homes or like or, or about the stuff they have? My house is so big. My house is bigger than Canada. Well, my house is bigger than Earth. Well, my Earth house is bigger than the universe, right? That, like that's what that's what Anselm is doing, right? He, he defines God as well. God, he's the best thing you can ever imagine, right? He's greater than that which he's, that which be greater than which cannot be conceived is the best English translation of this. And he builds a whole theology sort of around this. And one of the more interesting arguments for God's existence, God's existence. But there's a childlikeness even to the uh, the philosophical arguments of the proslogion. There's a childlikeness there. There's an adventurousness to this. Right? But uh, Balthazar also says that the child is the master of contemplation. Right? Uh, he lies in the cradle or in a meadow and watches. He watches for hours. And he notes it's not even clear if the child recognizes that he or she is looking at an object, right? Have you ever noticed that, like, I don't even know if he knows what he's staring at here. Is he just kind of blissing out? Is he having kind of a transcendental experience? I'm not sure. He says, but Balazar says that this contemplation hardly detaches itself from the identity which the subject and object have originally in God. Again, this is philosophy and theology. Before God created us, we were all just kind of ideas in his mind, right? There's a unity to us all. God creates us, and now we're multiple. But in contemplation, you kind of unite yourself to the object. I mean, if you've ever enjoyed a beautiful mountain or a beautiful uh, landscape or beautiful art or a beautiful person, and you kind of forget your own existence for a bit because you're united to them, all right? That's kind of what babies seem to be doing. And it's, what hap it's ultimately what happens in contemplation of God, all right? And now I've, you know, I've noticed we're all busy. It's hard for me to be productive when I'm home with Benedict. Um, I, I end up wasting a lot of time with him, quote unquote. But that's what prayer is, though, isn't it? Right? It's wasting time with God, and and it doesn't always like you come out of it feeling all blissed and restored, like you just came back from a retreat. Sometimes all you did was, well, with Benedict, sometimes all we do is stare at each other. Right? I see if I can make him smile. Right? For hours. <laughs> And yet it, that's self-rewarding. The contemplation is its own reward, right? I don't need to be productive. He, he's, he's my product, right? The product is the time we had together, is in and of itself. And that has really changed my perspective on prayer, that even if I don't feel necessarily like I had a great mystical experience, I hung out with God, all right? It definitely does challenge our idea of what it means to be busy and what's important, right? And I mean, ultimately, like this is, you know, there does come a point where I need to go plan a lesson or something right but but it, it it but it's all comes out of this right it's fueled i mean for example this this lesson i'm giving right now right it, it's informed by this experience that i have right and it all has a different meaning right i'm teaching so that i can be someone he'll be proud of right i'm trying to do the best job i have i can so that he can kind of look at me and be proud and want to imitate that in, in whatever it is he wants to do it, it it reframes everything else right because i've been contemplating him changes the way i think also, even if there's noise going on, even if people are uh, arguing or there's like something on TV or we're at, you know, we're after church and everyone's milling around being noisy, Benedict can still sleep in my arms. Right. And Balthazar says that's the same reason that Jesus could sleep in the boat during the storm. 
because he's always in his father's arms. Right? He always trusts him, just like he was in the cradle. Uh, and yes, this is at work, by the way, for those of you squinting and looking forward, like, wait, is that? Yes, this is this is when he visited. Uh, it was during spring break, so a lot of you were gone. But uh, yeah, Gemma, I know I included a lot of photos of him just in case in case the Chester session itself was lame so that at least this would carry you through super cute pictures of my son would uh, make up for my inadequacies. Um, now here's the thing, and this was commented too. like, he will cry out if he's hungry or if he's just lonely, right? If he's been in the cradle too long and no one's there and he's just, I guess, worried. He'll he'll cry out, right? And it reminds me a lot of Jesus on the cross, right? This moment of why have you forsaken me? And it, it, you know, this is one of these troubling things for us, right? Why would God Himself cry out to to His Father, to to God? God cries out to God, why have you forsaken me? Right? But and of course, when we say, sometimes when adults say this, we mean it as a cry of like genuine atheism, right? I don't even know if I believe in God right now or if God loves me. Well, Benedict does this too. He cries out. But I've noticed that when I come to him, when I pick him up, when I start feeding him, instantly, he doesn't harbor any resentment to me. He's just happy that I'm there. Right. It, and so I think of Jesus, how moments after he can say, my God, why have you forsaken me? He then says, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Right. Despite, despite how... Despite how sad he felt how very genuinely upset he was i mean and you know you've all heard babies cry they cry from their core it's from the very heart they're upset and yet in a moment it, it, it kind of passes which doesn't mean it wasn't genuine but it means they kind of un underneath it there was that trust right and then they forget and that they're willing to kind of almost forget it right because they just want to be with you right and then uh, there's a, there's a line that's pretty fantastic about um so obviously babies are are humble and weak and weak but and so how can how can that be an image of God, right? God rules the universe. Well, Balthazar says, and again, you can really tell he lived with with a family. Uh, he says, uh, well, the word he says what he says is babies are in a sense all powerful. They're omnipotent. He says the word clothes its divine superiority ever more in the laughing helplessness of a tiny child. Omnipotence asks through a child. It uses the child's irresistibility, the unconscious charm of the child's gestures, in order to gain that which can be given freely. This is an everyday experience. It's the best phrase. These charming little tyrants keep adults occupied all the time. Their mother is busy with them the whole day. Even when they are asleep, one has to be quiet. And when they play, they often take up the whole house and nothing is safe from them. Right? Babies rule the home with, by their humility, right? by their loveliness. You think that might be a bit about how a bit of a bit similar, I guess, to how God rules the universe. Right? And and how Christ rules us, right? Ultimately, like it's is it's an invitation of He loves us so much, and He's so willing. He's so He yields His power to us in a lot of ways, right? We are His hands and feet. Right? He doesn't act except through us in a lot of cases. So, how does He does He command us? You know, the way that God used to sort of command Israel, well, to some extent, but it's also this invitation, right? There's a helplessness to Christ, but a, a, a beauty to Him, a loveliness to Him that enthralls us, literally enthralls us, right? Thraldom means slavery. We're enthralled we're in, by, by the loveliness of Christ, the glory of Christ, the beauty of Christ, the, beauty, the glory of the Lord, right? Just like babies rule over us this way, right? Yeah, this, is, this picture is after the very first time he rolled over when he was on his belly and he realized, he figured out how he could push himself over to his back. So that's why he's got that smugness to him. He's got this confidence and pride to him, right? That... He's kind of broken through to something. He's he's learned something new about himself, and in learning something new about himself, he's uh, he's learned a new skill or a new power, right? And do you think this is how God looks at us? Do you think, for the record, in my mind, all of you, when you graduate in, a, in you know a few weeks here, this is how you look like to God? Hey, I learned something new. I, I got a new skill, right? <laughs> Just look at me. Right, that let the the beaming pride on all your faces. That's I think how it how God perceives it. It's also kind of how we perceive it, just between you and me. That's this is how we as teachers look at you. Like, oh, that's cute. They learned something new. <laughs> okay. Um. So here's here's the theological rationale for how Jesus can still be a baby. All right. Again, this is the head of your stuff. But Balthazar says that when Jesus ascended into heaven, he brought his whole human life up with him. Okay, so it's not just that like he his, he is back and alive again, and now he's 
bringing his new form up to heaven, but that he actually sort of, uh, he brings the whole Christ event up to heaven with him. Uh, and because he returns to his father, he brings that up into the life of the Trinity. Because remember, his life on earth is a picture of his life in the Trinity. All right. The way he uh, trusts his father and is guided by the spirit, that's, a, that's a, a created historical picture, I guess you could say, of the eternal processions of the, of the Trinity, right? Like God uh, begets the son and then to the two of them, between the two of them, they spirate this Holy Spirit. So they relate to each other through that. Well, the, the picture of that here is God sends Jesus down to earth and he's born of a virgin. So we know he's not made by men uh, and that he's guided by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is always between him and the father, just like in the Trinity, right? The father and the son together have the Holy Spirit between them as love. That's, it's kind of like how when you talk to it, this is John Calvin's example. For the Protestants in the room, John Calvin says that the, uh, when God speaks to us, He speaks to us like we speak to babies. So when I say like Man, Dick, you know, what is that toy? I'm not really speaking English very well, but that's how we that's how I get across to him as best I can. That's what God has to do to explain what it is like in the eternal, mysterious, beatific joy that is the Trinity. God has to kind of like talk not well in a sense talk talk down to us to literally condescend to us so okay how can it be that there are three persons and they relate they're distinct but they're also one and they proceed from each other well they kind of act it out for us in the life of jesus christ right and then once that mission is done the work of our salvation is done that's brought back up into the life of the trinity and because everything about jesus's life reflects the triune life reflects the life of god it kind of fits back into it all right so as as, as balthazar puts it the temporal, all too temporal, right? The historical, what happens in time. The temporal is made secure beyond all perishing in the eternal childlikeness of God. Right? So for us, uh, apart from God, right? Your, your childhood, sadly, is kind of lost, right? You know, the sands of the hourglass keep falling. Right? Time rushes forward like a river. But what Christ, what's happened with Christ is his whole life has been caught up into the eternity of heaven, of God. Which means... From his from the Immaculate Conception all the way up to the moment of his ascension, those that that's all in eternity now, which means God can distribute it throughout history. Uh, which is why, by the way, uh, mystics and uh, people who are meditating right, sometimes have this experience of, of beholding life, events from the life of Christ. Right, that's what Ignatian meditation is. You read the Gospels and you try to, through the Holy Spirit, enter into it with your imagination. All right, or uh, I mean, well. And then this is also sort of why, uh, I, I mean, God has the freedom to to, to accommodate to, it to us, right? To adjust Christ's life. And it's also where we get the grace from Christ, right? These are the actual graces of Christ's life being distributed to us. And anyways, I all wish to say, that includes his infancy. When Jesus is a child, that is caught up and brought into the eternal procession of the Son from the Father. So as, as uh, Balthazar puts it, it's true. The son at the right hand of the father is now no longer the child in a physical transitory sense that lay in his mother's arm on earth. But he is the eternal child who has assumed into his eternity all the forms and stages of his early childhood existence because his earthly childhood was already the word of revelation concerning his heavenly one. So that means his childhood and his childlikeness are available to all of us, even 2,000 years later. So again, he can... There's a childlikeness that spreads through his whole life. He's, in a sense, always the child. And also that, that period of his life where he was literally a child is in the eternity of the father now, which means it can be distributed to us. It can appear to us as a child, right? Uh, and as he has in some apparitions. So let me conclude with what this sort of means for us. Right? Uh, according to Balthazar and to me, for my own reflections, how, how do we become like children and like the child that is Christ? Well, some examples that Balthazar gives, we have to let God carry us around, right? So just like when he was an infant, right? Jesus let Mary and Joseph carry him around. Uh, to this day, he does this. We carry him in the host. Right? He lets himself be uh, br brought around by us uh, to wherever you know we care to take him, uh, which is a reflection of how, as the son, he's obedient to the father and lets the father, through the spirit, guide him wherever he wants him to go, right? He's baptized and then immediately sent out into the wilderness to deal with the temptation of Satan. Does he want to do that? Maybe not, but he lets the father take him there. Right? We need to be like this too, right? Let the father take us wherever he wants us to go. Again, especially for those of us who are about to graduate and, and maybe making a lot of decisions right now about our future. Uh, that's cooperation with grace. 
but make sure you're childlike in the sense that you're willing to let God carry you somewhere that might surprise you. It's like what Jesus said to Peter, right? You know, when you're old, you'll <laughs> you'll stretch your arms out and uh, people will will clothe you and you'll be taken where you don't want to go, right? There's something childlike about that. It's like when you're trying to put clothes on a child, a little baby, right? and you got to carry him somewhere. He may not want to do it, but that's what happens to Peter. And of course, Peter ultimately, uh, I mean, that, that's fulfilled on the cross. Right? He's crucified upside down. That's what Jesus is referring to. And all of us are also called to, to the cross in some sense. Also, uh, even when we are confused and upset, we should trust God. Right? I mean, that's why my son gets so confused and upset, I think, because he trusts me. So where am I right now? It's not that he's doubting it. It's that it's confusing to him. Where's Papa? Why isn't he caring for me right this moment? I know he would. Right? So there's a, a confirmation when I arrive. But even in that moment of worry, I don't think he loses his faith or his trust. Maybe that, ha- I mean, that happens to us, right, as we age. And then um, to some extent, that's a good thing because we shouldn't be trusting humans fully. We're not God, right? We, we are all fallen and we're going to disappoint. Uh, but Balthazar makes this point elsewhere, too. I, I cut it from the presentation, but he says there's something very holy about children because they don't yet distinguish between the love of their parents and the love of God. Right? At that point, that's still their experience of God's love. Uh, and so there's there's something holy about the fact that they trust their parents so implicitly. Uh, again, we need to be impractical. This is tough. This is tough when you have lots of marking and planning to do. All right? This is tough when you have... Uh, a doctorate candidacy evaluation coming up. It is very, very tempting to say, sorry, God, I got stuff to do this morning. I don't have time to pray. That is a terrible idea. And and Benedict has forced me to, because I would be doing more of that, but I see him in the crib and I think, I will not always have this time with Benedict. I should just stop what I'm doing and hang out with him right now. But I won't have this moment with God again either. Every moment you have is a moment you could be spending with God. And again, that doesn't mean it's always contemplation. As Balthazar talks about this too. There should be a marriage of contemplation and action at all times. Action should explain contemplation. Contemplation should modify action. But be willing to waste. There should be a certain uselessness from a, from a, from a worldly point of view, let's say. So be willing to be impractical. Be willing to waste time with God in prayer and contemplation. And even in action, right? There, there's times where you might do good and loving things for others, and you don't see the fruit of that. Again, as teachers, we know this. I taught in China. I am likely not going to see the result of what I, of what most of my, probably all of my grade threes. I will probably never know if I sowed any seeds that are going to grow with them. Doesn't matter. Like Jesus says about the sower, the parable of the sower. He doesn't see the plants that grow from that. Right. For all I know, I was wasting my time out there trying to evangelize in that communist country to those kids. Doesn't matter. Right. Be willing to waste time for God. Uh, and then there's also the sense that we should be very adventurous. Right. Don't be afraid to, um, there should be a sort of joy and excitement to the Christian life. Yes, it's, it's a cross, but it is also a commission, right? Uh, we are, I mean, like C.S. Lewis said, we are, we are spies in an enemy territory, right? We're, we're the heroes of an epic story, right? And that should, that should influence us. Just like when kids play games, they're excited because, you know, they're the hero of their story, right? Uh, as, as Balthazar again says, the, the Christians were all, in their being always a generation younger than everyone that surrounded them, opposed them, and persecuted them. Like boys who throw away their lives recklessly and without counting the cost for the sake of an adventure that is fun. They faced death. Youth is used to conquering. Don't lose that. Uh, my final thought there is that we should love unconditionally. Remember Dorothy Day, right? I only love God as much as the person I love the least. I don't understand why my son looks at me so lovingly. I mean, I know I was, you know, the first person who interacted with him when he was born in some sense. I mean, the doctors were all wearing gloves. He was in a, a plastic bassinet crying and everyone's milling around him and they're not stopping to care about him. And I get why. I mean, they have to for his own sake. But still, he was just lying there crying helplessly, and I, I put my, my uh, pinky finger out, and he grasped it with his little hand. And, you know, he stopped crying. My wife said afterwards, she, she noticed that, like, why isn't he crying anymore? Right? Uh, as Mrs. Wright says, that was the first experience. I don't think it was the first experience of, his, of God's love. I think his first experience of God's love was when he was in his mother's womb. I think he already felt her love there how careful she was all the time to make sure he was well-nourished and protected. But despite that, I, I still don't know how he, 
I, I can't know how he infers from that that I'm the one he's supposed to love this much, right? He loves me so uncon. I, I don't. I've I've not done that much for him that deserves the way his eyes just light up when I put my head over the crib and he sees me. I I, I don't know where that comes from. I really don't. Um, I think there are there are dads who are more fun and funny and uh, like make funnier faces than me and are stronger than me and like their you know bounce their their sons better than me. But he he looks at me with such unconditional love. But I guess that's how God looks at me too. And I guess that's the way I should be looking at others too. Uh, and I'm, uh, I mean, here he is looking at his cousin, right? They were so excited to meet each other. Well, we're all brothers and sisters, right? As creatures of God. So that's how we should really be looking at each other, right? So I'm really grateful that he's taught me that, even though he's an infant, has no words. But he's still spoken to me. He's still taught me. He's taught me as much as a, a master's in theology ever has. And I hope he was able to teach you a little bit today, too. So are there any final questions or comments about that? Yes, that truly was a wonderful talk, Mr. Fawcett. Seriously, it was awesome. Yeah. And so here. Any, any, oh. it's, it's easy to talk about something you love so much. <laughs> uh, sure, yes. Yeah, I could, I could build a whole career out of talking about him. Yeah, I wish I could monetize that. I'm realizing as I look at these pictures, it looks like I'm implying that my son is a corollary to Jesus, and I'm a corollary to Chesterton, and I will not, um, uh, I will not uh, step back from that. It wasn't my intention, but I, I, I'm going to own up to that. So, both of you have the same smile. Well, thank you. So some of you have said that he looks like me, and I, I wish I could see it. To me, he looks like his mom. That's why he's so beautiful. But, but I'm happy. That I'm, I'm thrilled if people see it. I'm, he looks more like, like I said, when I was a baby, I, I looked shockingly like him. But uh. his, mother's, his mother's genes are strong, <laughs> but I think as mm. he, as he uh, yeah, his hair color. Um, I've, I've heard that from profile, he looks more like me. Yeah, and well, maybe that's true. Yeah, to see kind of that side, and but he'll definitely kind of you probably know, yeah. Well, good I, of both I, of them. You never see yourself in your children because you don't really look at yourself often. You look at your wife more often than you look at yourself, right? So um, that's what you'll and you generally. My, my children are adopted, and people say, "Oh, they look so much like you," and I just kind of yeah. laugh. It's what people want to see, right? Yeah. Well, in fairness, though, I've I've also been told that when he's when he's contemplating, he looks like me. Like when I stop, so maybe your kids do look like you, uh, Mrs. Wright, because I may have adopted some of your personality traits, and like there's a lot to that, right? In how a face looks, yes, right? very it's the, true. The emotion yeah. that they're showing, so yeah, and the behaviors, yeah. <laughs> a little philosopher king in the making. Uh, well, I hope he's a prophet, priest, and king, like Christ is, you know, as by virtue of his baptism. So, I think his his nose looks like my wife but okay well whatever that got that comment got five likes so i guess whatever i i yeah you can't see i can't see it but uh so did anyone have any not that i you know the ba babies look like our dad until they grow hair yeah. well he was born with a bunch of hair he's actually lost a bunch of it um which was my wife's my wife's distress but i mean it's gonna grow back but that's a good one maria um i think the ask. uh the the port uh, I can't remember your mom. Por I think it's Portuguese, Maria. Yeah, that that gene is strong in your family. So, <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, well, that's funny. My 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 mother says that she feels very close to Filipinos because she has a Filipino grandson. So it's funny. I I, I kind of wonder if my in laws think of him as their white grandson. I know it's just a funny uh, situation. How old is now? So he was born November fifteenth. So he's almost six months in a few days here. And how heavy is he? I don't know. He grew like a half kilo in the last week. So is he coming to grad? I hope so. I would love for him to, but oh, we'll see. It's, uh, I would love for you to all get a... It's funny, yesterday at church, he really... People, he's, he is magnetic. People just reach out and touch him on the hand. And of course, my wife and I are then frantically like trying to get the hand sanitizer to like <laughs> just still because, you know, we don't know. I don't know. People are hoping he'll heal them of their issue of blood or something like that, hoping power will go forth from him or something. But I mean, I get it. He's irresistible. I understand the impulse to want to touch him. But uh, 
But again, honestly, though, that does make me, unironically, that makes me re examine that story about Jesus, right? As he's walking through the crowd and people are trying to kind of grab at him. It's like, I, I have a new perspective on that from walking through a crowd with Benedict in my arms. Like what that kind of magnetism is like, that, like there's something about innocence and purity and beauty and joy that just like pulls people in, you know? <laughs> Thank you, Olivia. That's, that's kind of you. I know. Yeah. It's, I mean, I, I don't exactly blame people. It just makes me super self-conscious as a as a parent. I guess this is what it was like for the disciples too with Jesus. Like when people would crowd around him trying to you know, like don't don't bother him with kids or don't bother him with, you know, your your petty thing you want him to heal, right? But I guess that's what I am like with Benedict. So oh. Anyways, I, I could I could look at Benedict all day, but did anyone have any like sort of questions or comments or? No, I think we're good. I don't think there was any questions. No, I think so. I, yeah, there's. No. I will, I'll say something real quick, I guess. Then just because I do have the time, which I wasn't sure I would, because uh, I thought I was going to ramble more. Um, it was. It's a prone to happen. Balthazar says something else that's sort of interesting because he points out that the in the ancient world, children did not have a high status; they were just seen as like an incomplete adult. Uh, and of course, women also didn't have a uh, very high status. They were sort of seen as incomplete men. And those of you who've studied Aristotle will remember he has this whole weird scientific reason for why that is. Uh, and Balthasar points out that Christianity kind of discovers the, the mother and the child at the same time. Like it rehabilitates women and it rehabilitates children. And the reason for that, he says, is because I didn't talk about this because it's the whole thing. I know there's people in here who are probably strict Thomists, but you know Thomas Aquinas says that when Jesus was a baby, and it's not just Aquinas. The Church Fathers sort of say this. The Scholastics generally say this that Jesus was basically an omniscient baby, like that even as an infant in his divine nature, he he knew everything. In his human nature, he had to grow, but he was omniscient. And Balthazar says that you know that's there's some truth to that in a sense because he's he's always contemplating the Father, but that if you really make it that he just has all the knowledge in the world, he's not really a baby. Like that's not that's not a true infant. That's the body of an infant, <laughs> but it's not a true infant. Uh, and and where I'm going with this is, he says that babies only become aware. Thank you, Anna. Um, babies only become aware of their own existence in interaction with others. Right? When babies are first born, they don't know that they exist. <laughs> they don't know who they are. Everything's just sensations for them. So what is it that makes a baby aware of himself or herself? Well, it's it, it's the I and thou, as Martin Buber would say. The, the baby looks at a parent and in becoming aware of them, that makes them aware of themselves. And so what he says is it, what brings the child into full existence is the mother's smile. Right? When the baby looks at the smile of his mother's face, he becomes aware of his mother and loves his mother. And that makes him realize, Oh, I must exist too. All right. That the child developmental psychology there, uh, which shows, which again, not, not to go on a different tangent here, but Balazar points out that this is, human nature is none of us is independent like no man is an island right the baby is shaped by the people around him the constellation of people around him especially the mother at least in most cases right which means that the virgin mary herself is part of jesus's human nature because it's her smile that would have brought him into awareness of himself when he was born when he was a baby which is why everything about the virgin mary needs to be about god <laughs> Because she's so important to shaping the human psychology of Jesus, which is why she needed to be immaculately conceived. Uh, every child is womanized from my head. Yes, Chesterton. Chesterton had an interest, had a lot of insight into this. I could have, I could have made the, this whole talk about him too. But, but so, anyways, because because of this inextricable link between the mother and the child, uh, that's why Christianity kind of discovers them simultaneously. Right. Uh, and why the virgin so there's a lot of there's a lot of mary you could talk about here too maybe i should do a follow-up chester session about that my wife maria can be a, the image of mary because it's it's the mother's love for the child that again is the first icon that they have of god's love for them and it's actually what brings them into self-awareness and uh and again and, mary, and the, the virgin mother would have been the one who taught jesus all the traditions of the old testament right in in which he would have discovered his own mission so this, I mean, this is a whole other thing. Babies have to discover their mission from others. Like they have to learn, right? And and discover God in that. Uh, and Christ models that. And I see, and I certainly see that in Benedict too. Uh, I had pictures of him uh, play. My, my wife was able to special order uh, a, a teething rosary for him from Manitoba, which was cheaper than the one from China, shockingly enough, even though it was special made for him. And it's got his name on it, Benne. 
be and he's on it and he sucks on that and teeth on it uh for for us the catholic teachers uh permeation and integration it begins in the cradle actually right <laughs> uh so even, even you know i i like the idea that when he wants to teeth and calm down it he's going to associate that with prayer that's what's going to soothe him you know uh anyways there's lots <laughs> So as, for the record, I mean, this is what I think theology should be. There, there needs to be that really abstract, heady, like sit down and puzzle through the hard parts of it part, but it also should inform. Uh, you, you need both, right? You need, you need the experience and you need the the abstract stuff. And when done right, which I think Balthazar does, they should illuminate each other. I, 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 should, I am enriched as a parent because of my theology background, and I am enriched as a theologian because of my experience now with Benedict. Uh, and that's what I hope you can all kind of uh, discover as you kind of pursue your own education and, and grow in your own walks with God and study of the faith that I hope Chester Academy has given you a good launching pad for. Okay. Um, if there are no other questions, we can kind of just close in prayer. All right. I just want to thank you, Mr. Fawcett, for your time on this today. It was great. I thank you so much. Yeah, I'll let you close in prayer. Sure. Thanks so much. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for coming. God bless everybody.